their subject for this evening. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, tonight as we begin once again to, to uh, look into the book of Revelation to seek to understand it, we pray that your Holy Spirit once more would be our teacher and our guide. We're asking you, Lord, to open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law and out of thy truth. So bless us tonight with your presence is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. My windscreen is not working there. <laughs> All right, I'm going to change this out here and go into our, our uh, health talk tonight. How many of you uh, have interest in health? Yeah, sometimes you're, you're kind of forced into it, is that right? Sometimes uh, it is something that you don't have much of a choice in. Well, tonight we want to talk about these doctors, eight doctors that still make house calls. When was the last time you had a doctor come to your house? Anybody ever have that happen here? Okay, back in the old days, that's all they did, right? I mean, I, I think that kind of um, um, dates me when I remember it, uh, that we had health, house uh, calls for doctors. Well, this particular one, uh, we talk a, a lot about health care benefits, but what about self-care benefits? One of the things that medical, the medical profession is doing these days is it's trying to help patients to become a little bit more cognizant or aware of your own health, of taking care of your own health. Don't, in other words, depend on the doctor or the nurse or somebody like, like that to take care of it. And so there's, there's different things that we can do to help us with that. The following eight doctors are experts in improving physical, mental, and spiritual health. And again, these doctors do what? They make house calls. That's right. All right. So uh, here's the first one as we look at this one. Nutrition. You ever think of nutrition as a doctor? Well, when you get up to eat in the morning, do you think about the nutrition of what you eat? We ought to, because a lot of what we eat can make us sick or it can make us healthy, right? So the first doctor that makes a house call is one called nutrition. And you and I can uh, read and study that and we can get to know what is the best nutrition for our bodies. The second doc doctor that makes a health car a call is fresh air and exercise. We oftentimes work inside. A lot of people, do any of you work inside all day? Yeah, so is it always good air inside? Not necessarily. Uh, it may be hot in here, but there's a fair amount of fresh air coming in, even though it's hot air coming in. And it's hotter up here, by the way. <laughs> it gets hotter as it goes up. But fresh air and exercise are definitely doctors that can help you with your health. Uh, those are things that science has told us are extremely important to our, our well-being and our, our health. Number three is rest. I was just reading in the news the other day that, that one of the biggest problems in America today is, is sleep deprivation. That we're not getting enough sleep. And we always thought it was just our kids, right, our teenagers, that, that wanted to sleep all the time. Well, as we become adults and we get into the busy rat race of earning a living and taking care of kids and maybe going to school or whatever, uh, science is finding out that we're not getting enough rest. How many hours, by the way, should you probably get every night? At least eight, seven or eight hours a night. Now it can be different for each person, a little bit different, but basically that's the general rule. So that's the third doctor. Here's the fourth doctor. Attitude. What kind of attitude do you have? Do you know that your attitude can help you live longer? Did you realize that? Yeah. A merry heart does good like a medicine, the Bible says. And there's a reason why God had the prophet write that. Because if you're always down in the dumps, if you're, if you're always looking on the negative side, if the glass is half empty all the time, 
how are you going to feel inside? Kind of in the dumps, right? Depressed or whatever. And so an attitude can make a big difference. And those are things that we can make a choice about. You can make a choice about what your attitude is. All right, number five. That is relationships. Our relationships can make a big difference in our health. They say that men live longer when they're married. Wives, did you know that? You're good for your husband, right? Yeah, you're good for your husband because they live longer, they have more contentment, and their health is, is better. Our relationships are very, are very important. When you don't have good relationships, or, if, or maybe you're a loner or whatever, it can be very difficult on your, your health, the health of your body. All right, what is the sixth one here? Get that thing out there. Oh, okay, mental fitness. What is mental fitness? Well, you know, that seems like it's an awful lot like um, uh, attitude, right? But your mental fitness has a tendency to do with, with what are you doing with this muscle up here between your ears? Do you realize, well, it's, technically it's not really a muscle, right? But it's something that we need to use, right? If you don't use it, my granny used to say, what? You lose it. That's right. Uh, she was a good one to always say that. And so we need to be able to use this thing, and it will help us uh, be mentally alert and mentally fit all the way through our lives. My mom is, is 86, 86, 87, 86 years old right now, and uh, she does, she's done crossword puzzles all her life, and that seems to help keep her mentally uh, active and, and aware of things. All right, let's look at number seven here. Positive choices. Ah, what kind of choices do you make in your life? Are those choices good choices or are they bad choices? We oftentimes, as parents, we talk to our kids about making sure that they make what kind of choices? positive choices, choices that are going to benefit them, that are going to uh, encourage a good outcome. Uh, it's just as true for us as adults to make positive choices as well. And then number eight, we have spiritual health. That's another factor that science has been studying, and I'm not sure how they can study it except that they just notice the results. And what they've done is they've studied people of faith people that are religiously inclined, that have a tendency to go to church or are uh, connected to, to a, a, a church or religion. And they found that they are happier, they are healthier, typically. Now, it doesn't mean that simply because you join a church that you're going to be healthy, but there is a tendency when you belong to something like that, uh, in, especially in a spiritual sense, that it promotes good health. So those are the eight doctors that make house calls, and you can find that uh, they can be a blessing to you uh, throughout your life. Even though we live in a world of sin, sickness, and suffering, God has provided eight natural doctors designed to improve physical, mental, and spiritual health. Simple things. You know, we've gotten into the habit these days, friends, of depending on complex things. How many of you have a complex thing that's on your hip or in your pocket. Right, a smartphone, whatever. Do you know how it works? Could you describe to me how it does what it does? Probably not. It might as well be magic, right? <laughs> but it's very, very complex. And, um, and so we don't, we don't even know how it, it does what it does, but it does work. But we've got something here that are very simple uh, doctors that can help us tremendously in, in our experience. Third John verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prosper, prospers. <laughs> okay, bless your heart. I have a, a saint says that if I want to take off my coat, you guys would be okay with that. I'm all right so far. I'll, we'll wait till it gets really hot, right? 
All right, well, let's go into the subject now. And uh, as we do that, I'm going to put this slide up here to begin with because I told you last night that we are going to provide online a site where you can go to YouTube and view these, these presentations each night. And so if you want to copy that down, that is the web address, uh, YouTube address, where you can go and you can watch last night's uh, video. So uh, we'll have that for you periodically and we'll try to, probably try to get that out. In fact, if I could have one of you write that down for the registration table out there. So if you miss it here tonight, uh, it'll be out at the registration table. You can get it again, okay? So right now there's only one video up there. It is the video from last night. The key to understanding the book of Revelation is there. Uh, tonight's message will be there sometime tonight, early tomorrow morning, whatever. So, so if you have some friends that you'd like to share these with, by all means, you know, pass that along. And if you want to review some things that we talked about, you can go there and take a look at that. Uh, if you have some friends that, that you wanted to be able to see this, or last night's or tonight's, but you don't have the internet or they don't have the internet, we do have DVDs that we, can, that we can give you for that. So if you're needing a DVD that you'd like to share with somebody that um, uh, would like to see that, that particular uh, presentation last night, then let them know at the, at the registration table and we'll take your name down. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the Word of God tonight. Last night, we ended with this slide. And uh, we saw last evening that the key to understanding the book of Revelation was what? The sanctuary. Understanding the importance of the sanctuary. We'll take a brief look at that tonight again, but, but not so much it, because we're going to look at this particular word. Because in Revelation 21, verse 5, God says, or I should say the angel says to John and to you and I, he says, then he who sat on the throne, actually in this case it's God himself, says, behold, I make all things new. Right, for these words are what? They are true and they are faithful. And I posed the question to you last night that, or the comment I should say, that in this day and age, isn't it, it, isn't it hard to find the truth anymore? Because it seems to be that everybody's manipulating the facts or what reality is and whether it is a democratic side of, of viewing things or a republican side of viewing things or whether it's a church side, whether it's a Buddhist side, whether it's a Christian, whether it's Muslim. Everybody seems to be manipulating the facts today. And it's hard to know what is the truth? But here, the Bible, and specifically God, it says, is saying that the words that we saw last night, the words that we're reading in the Bible, are true and faithful. Now, here's the big question that we need to answer. If you're a skeptic like I was, big time, and I'm still a pretty good skeptic, I'm going to say to this verse right here, I'm just going to say, how do I know they're true? You ever do that? How do I know you're telling me the truth? Because anybody can say these words, can't they? Yeah. In fact, have you ever done that? Have you said, you know, I swear on a stack of Bibles that I'm not lying? Well, does that mean that any other time you're lying? No, but we say that to emphasize the fact that we're really telling the truth now, right? Which has got a problem in itself. Uh, <laughs> It's, it almost implies that sometimes we're not telling the truth. But you know how we do. We have those cliches that we use. And so we try to make people think that we're really, really telling the truth by using those kind of statements. Well, we have a big problem with trust in the world today. In my experience in life, I had a big trust issue with people. How many of you would be willing to put that thing on top of your head and have that blindfolded guy cut off you know, and I'm pretty sure he continued to cut off slices. I don't know if they were having a picnic and that's the way they sliced their watermelon, but that would be really a lot of trust there, right? To be able to trust that that guy was going to hit that and not your head. And of course, how many of you know the story of William Tell? Remember the story of William Tell? 
He was, uh, in order to gain his freedom, he was then to shoot this, this apple off the top of his son's head. And uh, you think his, his son trusted him? Well, he didn't have much choice in the matter, but definitely he trusted him. But our problem today is we've got trust issues. You have trust issues. I have trust issues. The world does. There are lots of people that have told us lies, who have led us down, in some instances, a primrose path and taken us or, or said things to us that were not true. And so when that's happened in your life, you come to the point of asking the questions, how do we get it back? How do we get that trust back, right? In fact, in the world today, there's a lot of problems in marriages. And many times the problems of marriages are because of a, a lack of trust. Trust has been broken. Am I right? And so then you go to a counselor. Well, the counselor tries to rebuild or to repair what's happened, but they, both those people, the man, and the husband and the wife, have to come back to what? And a willingness to trust one another again. And that can take some, some very difficult uh, experiences. In fact, we think that trust is so important that we write it on our money, right? What does it say there? In God we trust. But it's sure nice to have that green stuff, right? So, so trust is a big issue here. And when we're talking about trusting the Bible, specifically what Revelation says, we've got to come to some understanding of how to vet this book, how to uh, understand that it's valid, that it is, in fact, telling us the truth. Now, there's lots of books out there. We talked a little bit about that last night, but you can pick up the, the, the Complete Idiot's Guide to the Book of Revelation. You can pick up the Book of Revelation for Dummies, right? You can pick up lots of books that supposedly are going to tell you the facts about what Revelation is saying, what it's all about. Is that the best way to decide uh, the truth about something? I have nothing against the author of The Idiot's Guide or the Dummies book there. I have nothing against them. But I'm not so sure that simply because they printed a lot of other books about other things, that that necessarily makes them the expert and the premier source of truth about the book of Revelation. Uh, would you agree with that? They probably have some good ideas, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they, they know the truth. Now, National Geographic, I enjoy National Geographic. They put out a lot of things. But National Geographic has got into a lot of different documentaries. And they put out a documentary about the secrets of Revelation. Now, what typically does National Geographic put out? What kind of videos? What kind of production? Nature films, right? Or Aboriginal, they talk about the history of the world uh, through the different tribes or the nationalities, things like that. Well, they've delved into religion here, and they put out a, a video series called The Secrets of Revelation. And here's how they introduce it. It says, a brutal blueprint of Judgment Day or a coded political manifesto. This is how they advertise this series. National Geographic Channel unlocks the secrets of Revelation. The effort to decode the symbols in the book of Revelation is the quest to find the ultimate answer to the ultimate human riddle. How does this story end? Now, I trust National Geographic in a lot of areas. When they talk to me about, about, about the science of, of species, you know, or at least uh, animals and plants and things like that, I think they know to a certain degree what they're talking about, don't you? But when they get into uh, religion, and specifically the book of Revelation, I'm not sure if they know everything of what they're talking about. In fact, I saw this, this particular uh, documentary or video, and uh, it depicts John the Revelator as, a, uh, as maybe a madman, that he was kind of crazy. And through those, the, his craziness, he had these warped pictures of what the future was like. 
And maybe as it says here, he wasn't talking so much about spiritual things or the future as he was about a political manifesto. Kind of like the Unabomber did uh, when he was doing his thing and, and killing people. So we want to remind ourselves tonight as we go into this subject that we need to know that we can trust this book. Because this book is going to tell us things that are vitally important to our existence. What did I say it's going to tell us? It's going to tell us things that are vitally important to our very existence, to our salvation existence, in fact. If somebody is going to warn you about something, if someone is going to instruct you in something, you need to know whether you can trust them, right? You're not just going to take anybody's advice simply because they might have a PhD or they might say that they have the truth. You need to know for a fact that they're trustworthy. And the way that you do that is that you validate them. You, you, find, you vet them, as it were. You figure out a way to, to find out, are they trustworthy? All right? So God has given us a way to tell whether the book of Revelation is trustworthy tonight. We saw as we looked last night that salvation history was uh, revealed to us through the work of the Old Testament sanctuary in the wilderness. In the book of Psalms, verse 77, verse 13, the psalmist says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? When the psalmist said this, he was telling a profound truth. He was telling us what the key of understanding life and the Bible was all about. He says, your way, O Lord, is in the what? In the sanctuary. And we found last night that the understanding of the book of Revelation is, uh, very, is helped us tremendously by understanding the sanctuary. All right? So here he says again that your way, your way of operation, your mode of operation, the way you're going to save mankind, the way that you're going to deal with your creation is found in the sanctuary. We found that last night as we looked at that. Here's another one in Psalm 73, verse 3 and 4. Uh, David was lamenting the fact that it seems like the wicked seem to be getting away with evil. And he says, for I envied the arrogant and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Seems like they just get richer and richer, right? They're not trying to do good, but they are prospering. They have no struggles in their bodies, are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. How many of you have seen in our world today that it seems like people that are bad apples seem to get away with it? Isn't that true? Yeah, it's rife in our, uh, across our planet. There's lots of people that are getting away. There's, there's dictators in Africa, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. There's, there's people uh, in Russia. There's people in the Middle East. There's people even in America that are, are, are wicked people. And they seem to just be getting away from it and doing better and better and getting richer and richer. And that's the concept that the psalmist was lamenting. But then he says this, until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. That's quite a profound statement. The psalmist understood after he saw this dilemma and he was wondering, why am I trying to be good? Why am I trying to follow God, you know, and, and do the right thing when people who don't do the right thing seem to prosper, they seem to get rich, they seem to just, you know, everything does, goes well for them. But then he says, I went into the sanctuary, and that's where I saw their end. So the sanctuary tells an incredible amount of how to, to uh, deal with that particular dim dilemma in itself. And we know, of course, from last night's study that Jesus, our Savior, went from being our sacrifice to our high priest and he's ministering in heaven for us today. Is that right? And we saw him and we saw the, the sanctuary symbols throughout the book of Revelation uh, last night through, as we walked through it. So let's take a look at this once again and notice the, uh, what we saw last night. In that fact, this is your handout. 
that the book of Revelation steps us through Revelation, Revelation 1 through 11. We, are, we see ourselves in the holy place, and then we come to the most holy place, and then Revelation 11, 19 through to the end of the book, 22, verse 20, or chapter 22, uh, we see activities associated with the most holy place. And this is a salvation history of all mankind while we're down here on our planet. And then, of course, I, I showed this last night, and we're going to be looking at this tomorrow night. We're going to look at the message to the seven churches of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we'll take a look at this timeline. And, but just for the, to, you to notice right now that after 1844, we are in what's called the Laodicean church era. Now, the Laodicean church is the seventh and last church of this prophecy. And we're going to talk about the significance of that, too. And that started in about 1840, and it goes until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the book of Revelation, uh, Wikipedia tells us, it's a free dictionary online, you can look this up yourself. It says, although Revelation rarely quotes directly from the Old Testament, almost every verse alludes to or echoes older scriptures, in other words, the Old Testament scriptures. Over half of the references stem from what book? Daniel. That's very significant to our subject tonight. All right? Come, uh, stem from Daniel, Ezekiel, Psalms, and Isaiah, with Daniel providing the largest number in proportion to length and Ezekiel standing out as the most influential. So with that understanding, we're going to take a look tonight in the process of validating the truthfulness of the book of Revelation, we're going to take a look at the book of Daniel. All right, let's take a look uh, before we do that at Revelation. We're going to notice that there are some bookends on the beginning, at the beginning, at the end of Revelation. We'll notice that in chapter 1, verse 1, it uses this phrase, what must soon take place. In chapter 22, verse 6, it uses the same phrase. So in other words, they're paralleling. Like I said, they're bookends. And you got a chart tonight that shows, uh, that is designate the mirror-like structure of the book of Revelation, right? That is how this book is laid out. Now friends, if, if Revelation was done by a madman, would you expect it to have an intricate uh, structure to it? Would you expect it to have um, a lot of systematic uh, consistency all the way through it? Typically what happens when you have somebody that is an eccentric or, or, or is, a, is a mad person, they kind of are all over the map. What we're going to see tonight just briefly is that this is laid out, this book is laid out like an equation, like a mathematical equation. In fact, here is what I gave you there. What we find is the first half of Revelation is the great controversy in progress. It's the historical half. History continues through here, but then it goes into the eschatological half. Now, that's a fancy name for the last day events, okay, the things that are going to happen in the last days. So what this means is there are references, there are scriptures that parallel what's here in the last of the book. The second one, there are parallels here, there are parallels there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on you on this, but I simply want to show you that Revelation is laid out like a math mathematical formula, and it is incredibly, uh, it is, it's incredible genius. How many of you play chess? All right, good, good. How many of you ever tried to play three-dimensional chess? In other words, that's three different boards. So you're moving not just on one board, but you're moving your pieces on three different boards. Now, if you think that chess by itself is complex and difficult, try playing it on three different boards, on three dimensions, right? And yet, it is, it is very understandable if, if you spend the time, you know, trying to figure it out. And it is the same way with the book of Revelation. It is very much like that. Let me give you a for instance. What, I, what we saw in that particular graph there with the colors is what's called a chiastic structure. It is a literary device that the Hebrews used very often 
in their writing of things. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 is set up in a chiastic structure. I'm going to give you this handout tomorrow night, so uh, we'll take a look at that then. In chapter 2, just within the book of Revelation, uh, or of this particular chapter, there's another chiasm. In other words, what that means is the first part of this section, verse 18, parallels the last part. Eyes like a flame of fire. There's fire there. Morning star. Stars are made of fire, right? And uh, so things like that. Then uh, chapter 12 of Revelation, you have another chiasm. Chiasms are all through the book of Revelation. The reason I'm bringing this out to you tonight is I want you to understand that this book is not written by a madman. This book has been inspired by none other than the God of the universe, the creator of the universe. John was not smart enough to do this. Okay? God is the one that put this together. All right, so as we look at the book of Revelation, we come to the, to the realization. In fact, let me go back for just a second here because... Um, uh, right in the middle, Revelation 12 is basically right in the middle of the book of Revelation. And in the middle of that chapter, you have what I call the victory formula, that the saints overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. And the blood that was shed by the Lamb was shed on Calvary's cross. Amen? So at the very center of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ, our sacrifice. So we see the gift that God gives us in Jesus there. Now, as we look at Unlock Revelation tonight, as we look at Revelation, and we want to ask ourselves the question, how can I know that what I'm hearing tonight from Pastor Stewart is true? When he reads from this book, from the book of Revelation, we, when he reads from any other place in this book, how do I know it's the truth? And some of you may say, well, I just know it is. But friends, that wasn't good enough for me. You know why? Because I got taken in life. Remember I said I had trust issues? And a lot of you have been taken too. And sometimes we just accept what people say and we don't know whether it's true or not. We just like it and so we hope it's true. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to provide what God has provided in validating his own truth, all right? So, is this human origin, is revelation of human origin, or is it divine? And that's what we want to in investigate tonight. Of the 404 verses in Revelation, 278 contain material from the Old Testament. The book of Daniel for instance, has many parallels to Revelation, ranging from the subjects of the end times, beasts that, are, that come up from the sea and land, uh, the Antichrist, the judgment, uh, the succession of nations, and war against the church and the false church, and we could go on and on. So there's a lot of similarities in the book of Daniel and Revelation. Revelation reveals the things that were written in the book of Daniel and throughout the rest of the, of the Bible. And, and it continues also to reveal a series of prophecies that end in the second coming of the Messiah. Every prophecy that we're going to look at in the book of Revelation ends in the second coming, or a prophecy of the Messiah. In fact, Jesus encourages us to understand the book of, of Daniel. He says in the book of, of Matthew, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. By the way, where's the holy place? In the sanctuary. You see the references we keep coming across? Whoever reads, let him understand. So Jesus himself said, we need to understand the book of Daniel. Now, here is the reason why. When, when we look at Revelation chapter 10 in a future uh, session, we'll notice a, uh, an angel with an open book in his hand. And we're going to come to find out that that's the book of Daniel. All right? I'm not going to explain why I know that right now, but let's continue. Jesus said in John 13, verse 19, he says, Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that what? I am he. If I got up here 
and I predicted tonight that one of you was going to give birth tomorrow morning, a, a woman, <laughs> um, and it happened, would you be pretty uh, amazed at my ability to predict that? Yeah, especially since nobody's pregnant here tonight. I don't think anybody's pregnant, right? If I got up here and I said, you know, let's say something a little bit less uh, outlandish, that you were going to be in an accident at 8, 8.45 tomorrow morning, and it happened, you'd think, wow, how did he know that? Wouldn't you? And you be you begin to think, well, he must have some kind of connection with God that he's be able to figure that out. What Jesus is doing here is he's telling you, this is the way that you can validate me that you can tell whether I'm telling the truth or not. He says, now I tell you before it happens that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am He, that I am the Messiah, that I am the Son of God. Okay? So what He's telling us is that God has given us prophecy to validate whether this book is telling the truth or not. Because the book of Revelation, as well as the rest of the Bible, is full of prophecy. Friends, when I was in the world, when I was, I was out there searching, I looked into Buddhism, I looked into to atheism, I looked into to, uh, Eastern religions, all kinds of stuff. The, the Egyptian book of the, the dead, and not one of them talk about how to tell whether it's the truth or not. They just figure you're going to accept it because I say it's truth. Now, if I did that to you, would you automatically believe me? Well, you shouldn't, because you need a little bit of proof, right? The Bible, Christianity, is the only book, the only ism I know that says, I'm going to prove to you that I'm telling the truth. And he does that by giving us prophecy, okay? All right, so Proverbs 22, verse 28 says, Do not remove the ancient landmarks which your fathers have set, in other words, those landmarks, those prophecies, those things that are written are there for a reason. They are there to help us to be able to validate whether God is telling the truth or not. All right, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, to the book of Daniel, and we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to be keeping you a little bit late tonight, I can tell already, but Daniel chapter 2 is where we're going to begin. If you have a seminar Bible, that's page 1,111. Page 1,111. And we're going to take a look at an incredible prophecy in the book of Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And he has had a dream. And we're not going to have time to read all through the dream tonight or the, or the book, but I want you tonight to go home and read through chapter 2, all right? We're going to hit the high spots of it this evening. But in this dream, it begins by Nebuchadnezzar having conquered uh, Israel and taken them into uh, Babylonian captivity. And while he's there, he has, he has Daniel, uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, who are all... Hebrew captives that are there with him and he's made them into wise men and he has this dream one night that he can't remember for the life of me he, uh, for the life of me he cannot remember what the dream is he says in verse 3 chapter 2 verse 3 and the king said to them I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream and so he calls all his wise men all his counselors and he says tell me the dream now you know why he called them because some of them claimed to be uh, able to interpret dreams. That dreams were very special, and so they were supposed to give him the, the answer. Well, they couldn't figure it out. One of the reasons they couldn't figure it out is because he didn't remember it. Now, if you ask somebody to, to tell you uh, what your dream was, and you haven't even told them first, what are the chances of your being able to interpret it or at least tell it? No, you're going to say, well, tell me what it was first, and then maybe I can help you with the interpretation, right? Well, that's what the wise men did, and, they, and the, the, the king said, you know, listen, it's off with your head if you can't tell me the dream. And they said to him, there is no man on earth that can tell what is the, the, the nature of gods. You know, only the gods know dreams. And so Nebuchadnezzar decides that he's going to kill them all. In fact, it says, 
uh, in verse 12, For this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Now you might ask the question, why was he so furious? Why did he want to kill all of them when just a few of them didn't know what it was? Well, the answer is found in two things. Number one, he's a despotic king. He has absolute power. And they had a tendency to lop off anybody's head that didn't do what they wanted them to do. So that's the first reality. The second thing is, in their religion, their pagan religion, he believed that God spoke to them through dreams. And he's wanting to know what God said. And so he calls for his counselors. He calls for his magicians. He calls for those that are supposed to have the answer, and they don't have the answer. And so he's furious. And so Daniel and his friends find out about this, and they decide to ask for time. And so they ask the king for permission to, to take it to the Lord, to, to go to prayer, and ask God to give them the answer, right? So, so what does it say there in in verse 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah's companions that they might seek mercies from the God in heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19 says, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So Daniel gets the dream, not only the dream, but also the interpretation of the dream. All right? So, in this particular dream, let's drop down to verse 28. Daniel comes back to King Nebuchadnezzar now, and Nebuchadnezzar says, Can you make known to me the dream? And he says, verse 28, There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what's this next phrase? What will be in the latter days? In the Hebrew, the emphasis in the sentence structure is on the latter days. So whatever else this prophecy is about, the part about the end of it is the most important part. Okay? So that's what he wants to know. To, to, wants us to understand. So, what will be in the latter days? So, Daniel then begins to give an, an interpretation. God is about to reveal to us the march of history, in fact, the rise and fall of empires, but the emphasis that he places on this prophecy is not on the nations, but on the very end of the prophecy. We're going to take a look at what that end of the prophecy is in just a second. All right, verse 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. You were watching, it says in verse 31 on the screen. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great what? A great image came up. So Daniel sees this great image and he reveals it to the king, and the king is probably sitting on the edge of his chair as Daniel begins to reveal the dream. Yeah, yeah, it's coming back to me, Nebuchadnezzar is saying. I remember that part. That's exactly what happened. He says, you saw this great image. Verse uh, 31, uh, this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands, verse 34, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer fleshing, threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole world. And so Nebuchadnezzar is undoubtedly shaking his head and saying, yeah, that's exactly what I saw. Now what does it mean, right? What does it mean? That's exactly what I saw. So let's see what it means. Here's this image, and in Jeremiah we find out that 
this, this, symbol, this, this dream is full of symbols. We know that it says that this stone that struck the image became a great what? A great mountain. In Jeremiah 51, verse 24 and 25, it says this, And I, God, will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil that they have done. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. So what we find here is we let the Bible interpret itself. When Daniel says that he saw that the stone became a great mountain, the mountain represents a kingdom. All right? Babylon is who God is talking about here. Babylon is likened to a mountain that was destroying all the earth. Okay? And so God was saying that I'm going to repay Babylon for its, its uh, arrogance. And so a mountain can represent a kingdom or a, uh, an empire here. Let's continue. Verse uh, 37 and 38. You, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. So Daniel begins to interpret it. And he says to King Nebuchadnezzar, this statue you saw, the head was all of gold. You, Nebuchadnezzar, represent the head of gold. So what we re recognize here is God begins to lay out a timeline of future history. I tell you before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you might believe and trust me, God says. Remember what Jesus said? So God is laying this out, and we know from history, from secular sources, that Babylon was one of the most splendid of all the empires of antiquity. In fact, Babylon, uh, as far as its size, was about 10 miles around. Now, that might not seem very big compared to some of the cities we have today, but Rome was only six miles around, and Athens was only four miles around. So Babylon was huge in those days. It was a massive city. Not only was it a massive city, but it also had one of the seven wonders of the then known world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Uh, history tells us that, that Nebuchadnezzar built that for his Persian wife because she'd grown up in the, the hills of, of Medo-Persia and she missed all the hanging gardens, all the, the stuff there. Babylon was also the temple where the temple of Marduk was and it was 300 feet high. Outside it was covered with blue glazed tile. Inside it was overlaid with gold. Now how much gold was that? In the temple of Marduk, it contained 18, what? Tons of gold. Eight and a half tons in the altar and the throne alone were in it. So was Babylon known for its gold? You bet it was. It was the golden kingdom. It fit the typology in God's dream that he gave to King Nebuchadnezzar. So an enormous amount of gold in there. Babylon also was well fortified. It had a 20-year supply of food. They built the walls around them to withstand sieges against enemies. And so they amassed 20 years worth of food to outlast any enemy who would seek to surround them and starve them out. Incredible power uh, that Babylon had in those days. So Babylon represents the head of gold. We know from, from history that Babylon began in, in 605 B.C. and lasted until 539 B.C. as the head of gold. But Daniel goes on as he interprets in verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. That was probably not what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to hear. He wanted to hear that Babylon was going to last forever. But God says, no, the next thing to happen is there'll be another kingdom inferior to yours that will come along and, and conquer you. Persia, or the Medo-Persian Empire, is represented by the chest and the arms of silver. We know historically that Medo-Persia came on the scene and conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. and lasted until 331 B.C. Now, as we look at this, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 13, verse 17, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, against the Babylonians, who will not regard silver. As for gold, they will not delight in it. About 150 years before Babylon was ever came into existence, 
God prophesied that the Medes and the Persians would overthrow Babylon. And so it was incredible uh, how this took place. We know that, of course, you've heard about the writing on the wall, meaning, meaning, tekel, you parson. God told uh, King Belshazzar that your, your kingdom is found wanting and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. And we know from history that, that King Cyrus, the, he diverted the flow of the Euphrates River, which flowed underneath Babylon, and he marched his troops through the, the dry uh, riverbed into the city and conquered it in 538 B.C. God named Cyrus approximately 150 years before he was born. Isaiah tells us that. Isaiah 41.1, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue, na to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors. Those were the lead gates in the Hebrew that closed off the Euphrates to them being able to get in. Uh, that will not be shut. Friends, this was 150 years before Cyrus was even born. And he names him by name. We're looking at trying to validate this book. Can we trust it? Can we trust the book of Daniel? Can we trust the writer of this book? He's trying to prove to us, friends, that he knows the end from the beginning. He predicts things, and when they come to pass, we know that he's trustworthy. Daniel 2, verse 39, Daniel goes on. Then another, a third kingdom will arise, a kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. Any of you know your history? What's the next kingdom, the world or empire after Medo-Persia? It was Greece, that's right. And we have none other than Alexander the Great. He crossed the Hellenspout there with 30, uh, 35,000 men, and on the plains of Arabella, he met the Persian army of one million men. Now, if you were a betting man or woman, who would you think would win that battle? Persia, right? A million men against 35,000? But that's not what God said would happen. God said that the bronze kingdom would overrule the, the silver kingdom. And so the, the, the Greek empire just expanded from from. Uh, country to country. Greece took over the world in 331 B.C. and lasted until 168 B.C. It was the thighs of bronze. And then verse 20 of chapter 2, finally, Daniel says, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Anybody know what the next kingdom to rule the world was? It was Rome. That's right, the iron monarchy of Rome, the legs of iron, from 168 B.C. to A.D. 436 uh, A.D. We know that Rome systematically conquered the Mediterranean world, going from place to place in North Africa and the Middle East, up into the, uh, the uh, nations or the area of Europe. In the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Edwin Gibbons, who was not a Christian, by the way, said the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Even Gibbons understood that there was a prophecy that was an amazing one that laid out the, the, the transpiring of human history systematically and incredibly accurately. Daniel continues in verse 41. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Now, friends, there are people that say that Daniel 2 was written after the fact. But if it was, even the most critical of them put it before Christ was born. All right? So the natural thing for a, a false prophet to do would be say, after these legs of iron, here will come another kingdom that will last, right? That will take over Rome. But they don't do that. They say it'll be divided. By the way, how many toes are on that image? There are 10, okay? So that's important. So as we look at the demise of the Roman Empire, we find that it was not conquered by one empire. In fact, as the Huns began to move across into the Russian steppes, they began to push these Germanic tribes, the Lombards, the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, Visigoths, 
into the Roman Empire. And it was these pagan tribes that began to take apart the Roman Empire as it went downhill and as it got weaker. And they became the nations of Europe. For instance, the Franks became the French. The Anglos became the English, right? The Herli became the, the, uh, the Italians. And on, the, the, the Vandals down here were annihilated. And so those became the nations of Europe. And they took apart the Roman Empire. It became a, a group of, of quarreling nation states during that time. Daniel continues in verse 43 and he says, they, these nations, these ten chos that are weak and strong, that are kind of together but not together, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now there's a phrase there that's, that's pretty important. It says they will mingle with the seed of men. The seed of men is a euphemism in the Hebrew for sexual relationships. Okay? It means they'll intermarry. Now this is, this is an incredible detail that God gives in this prophecy. If you go to the Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark, you will see an incredible mural on the wall that shows the family tree of Europe. And on that family tree, you will find that Europe is interrelated. Every country in Europe is interrelated with each other. Why? Because what kings and queens would do is they would intermarry with another country to either make peace or possibly to get more power so they could try to unite the, the uh, European continent. And so they did that through the centuries from the time of the fall of the Roman Empire all the way down through the, the monarchies into the, 19, uh, the 20th century. It's an incredible piece of, of detail that God puts in there that only he could have known. And so they're all interrelated and that's why he says they will mingle with the seed of men but they will not, what? Adhere to one another. Is Europe still fighting against each other? Are they united? No, they haven't been, in spite of the fact that through history, since the time of the Roman Empire, there have been people that have been trying to unite them. In fact, Charlemagne was one of the first ones in 800 uh, AD, tried to unite all over Europe again, bring back the glory of the Roman Empire. He failed. Then when there was Charles V, who ruled over what was called the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't an empire, and it wasn't very holy either. But he failed as well. And then, of course, there was Napoleon. Napoleon in the 1800s, 1900s, he said there will be one Europe, one currency, one language, one government over all of Europe. Was Napoleon able to bring that about? No, he wasn't. In fact, at Waterloo, this is what he said. God Almighty is too much for me. Somebody shared with him the prophecy of Daniel 2 and where it said that they will not cleave to one another, they'll not unite, and in fact, it came true. Even though, if anybody could have done it, Napoleon could have done it. And then, of course, there was Kaiser Wilhelm. And then uh, we know, of course, of, of um, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler mirroring what what Napoleon said, he wanted there to be one people, one empire, and one leader. That was, that was Adolf Hitler's goal. Did he succeed? He almost did. He tried pretty hard. And if anybody could have done it, he could have. But what did God say? They shall not cleave to one another. There never will be a, a, a one world empire as there were with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. It says they will mingle with the seeds of men, but they will not adhere to one another. So we live now in the time of divided Europe from 450 or 476 AD to the present time. Friends, that's where we're at in world history. In fact, take a look at this again. The statue of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar got, Babylon, the head of gold, came and went. Persia, chest and arms of silver, came and went. Greece, the thighs of bronze, came and went. Rome, legs of iron, came and went. Divided Europe, feet of iron and clay, it's still here, right? That's the, almost the end of the prophecy. So let's take a look at this on a time uh, chart here, a timeline. Starting here, down here at the start of Babylon, 
God predicted that Babylon would come into existence back in, in the, the book of Isaiah. Did Babylon come into existence that God had prophesied? How accurate was he? 100% accuracy, right? I want you to watch this and I want you to think about this, friends, because we are validating the trustworthiness of this book. Revelation is full of the symbols of the book of Daniel, all right? So Daniel's prophecies ought to help us validate the book of Revelation, which we're going to be studying from here on out. All right, God said that Medo-Persia would follow Babylon in 539 B.C. How accurate was God's prediction? 100%. So he's got a pretty good track record so far, right? What's the next empire to come along? The Grecian Empire with Alexander the Great. How accurate was God's prediction? 100%. This guy is really good, this God, right? He's, he's predicting 100% accuracy up to this point. The next one to come along was the Roman Empire. How accurate was that prediction? 100%. Friends, Daniel gave this prophecy back in about 605 B.C. How did he know all this stuff was going to happen? God told him, right? And God knew the history. He knew the end from the beginning. And so then we know that after Rome came, he divided Rome or divided Europe. How accurate was God in that prediction, friends? 100% accuracy. Now, friends, look at this very carefully. We're talking about finding out if God is trustworthy. We know that there are people in this world that are not trustworthy. You may know some. I can name some. All right? Bernie Madoff took a lot of people's money, right? There's a lot of people that we could name. But God is saying, I am trustworthy, and I've given you prophecy to prove it. So he's 100% accurate here. So let's take a look at this again. So Rome, and then it goes to divided Rome. And God gave this, this prophecy not just for King Nebuchadnezzar. He gave this prophecy for you and I. Because he knew that we would be stiff-necked, that we would say, prove it. Right? I'm from Missouri. You need to show me that this is true, that I can trust you. He knew that we were like that. And so he gave this prophecy to King Nebuchadnezzar, and he told us that the very last thing to happen was what in this prophecy? That a stone would be cut without hands, right? And it would strike the image. In fact, let's take a look at that in, Reve in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a, a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in, people, in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. You see, friends, what this stone represents that's cut without hands, as it strikes the image, it is the second coming of Jesus Christ. As we look in the rearview mirror of our lives, of world's history, we see that the second coming is, is coming closer and closer. In fact, we know that it's going to be 100% accurate in the fact that it's coming, because why? Because everything that God has predicted in the, in the, in the prophecy of Daniel 2 has come true. The only thing that has not happened yet in this prophecy is the second coming. So what are the, what's the law of averages? Whether this is going to happen or not. I mean, the bookies in, in, in Las Vegas would love these kind of odds. They go down to the bank and they say, put it all on God. Because if he was accurate with all these others, we know the second coming's coming. Amen? Friends, you and I don't need to just wonder and guess whether the Bible is true or not. We don't need to wonder and, and speculate, well, is there going to be a second coming? Is Jesus coming? Friends, God has given us evidence. He's given us evidence in the form of prophecy. This is only one prophecy in all the Bible that God has given us. And he's telling us, you may know that I am he when it comes to pass. Who is he? 
He's Jesus Christ. He's the one you can trust. He's the one that wrote the book of Revelation that we're studying. He's the one that wrote the book of Daniel that we've just gone through. He's the one that has written every single word that's in here that says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You and I can trust the God of the Bible. He's shown us that he's trustworthy. The Muslims cannot do this with their Quran. The Babylonians cannot do this with the bag of Megiddo. The Egyptians that worship the Book of the Dead, a lot of the New Age people, they can't do this because they don't have prophecy like this. Or if they have prophecy, it's so vague that it could mean anything. Friends, was this prophecy vague? It's as clear as the nose on our faces, right? And God says, you can trust me. And so as we go into the book of Revelation, we're going to find that it is trustworthy. Daniel 2 verse 45 says, For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, that's all happened, or, or that's going to be happening, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is what, everybody? It's certain. And the interpretation is what? It is sure. It's going to happen. How did we start off our lecture tonight? We started it off with this scripture in, in Revelation 22, verse 6. And he said to me, These sayings are faithful and true. In Revelation, it claims that they're faithful and true, that you can trust Him. And the book of Daniel, the God of, the, of Daniel says, it's faithful and true, you can trust me. And tonight I want to leave you, friends, with a certainty that you can trust the God who wrote this Bible. You can trust the God who wrote these prophecies, who knows the end from the beginning. And Jesus Christ is the center of this prophecy. Jesus Christ is the center of revelation. And you and I can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that when he speaks, when he speaks in this word, in this book, that he's trustworthy. How many of you want to trust the Lord tonight to show you the truth? Father in heaven, you see the hands tonight of everybody. Lord, we're just thrilled to know that we can understand beyond the shadow of a doubt that the words that we read in this ancient manuscript are trustworthy because the author is trustworthy, faithful, and true. And we thank you for giving us something trust trustful that we can stand on in this world today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like you tonight as you go home and get ready for tomorrow that you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. That's what we're going to be looking at next uh, tomorrow night. So Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and we'll go into that particular prophecy and we'll see again that God knew the end from the beginning. God bless you and see you tomorrow night.